And then the next panelist, uh, Professor Giulio Licinio, uh, who is a professor of psychiatry at Flinders University in Australia. He's a very um, prominent, made a very important contribution in exactly the field that we um, are talking about, understanding the basic mechanism of psychiatric disorders. He's also the editor-in-chief of, I think, the most, the, the number one, it's not that I think, I know, the number one journal in this field, which is called Molecular Psychiatry. I think it says it's all, trying to understand the molecular mechanism of psychiatric disorders. So we will start with a brief presentation by Julio, uh, and then we will go on with Sophie. Hello. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Pierre for the invitation to be here. And in terms of thinking of what I would talk about today, I thought, since I have very little time, that the most important question in the field is the search for new mechanisms and pathways. So we have like traditional pathways and mechanisms like serotonin, dopamine, uh, stress hormones, etc. But they have helped us uh, with psychiatric disorders considerably, but they have not resolved the problem. And I don't think that it's further work on those same old targets that's going to really uh, generate a paradigm shift in the field. So the question then, I think, the very topical question, and as editor of molecular psychiatry, I'm seeing like a new kind of a flux of work that's looking at completely different things. And we have embarked in one of these uh, searches ourselves. So for the next like five minutes, I'd like to give you just a very uh, brief overview of what we are doing in that area. So specifically, we are looking now at the microbiome. So as you know, your body is mostly microbes. 90% of your DNA doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the multiple microbes that are inside and outside of you. And this just to give you an idea of how many species of uh, microbes are there um, in each area. And it's really like a flood of another type of DNA that you know, is encoding things that are having an impact on you. So. Um, if you're not really you, but if you're really your bugs, maybe your depression is not really within you, but it may be in your bugs. And if that's true, if we treat the microbes, your depression may go away. And that sounds like a wild fantasy, but you remember decades of psychotherapy and surgery for ulcers caused by stress, and it was a microbe after all. So um, in this um, upcoming, actually in the June printed issue of Molecular Psychiatry, we published uh, three papers on the microbiome, so I'll just give them a very brief overview here. One was a review showing that you can go from gut dysbiosis to altered brain function and mental illness, and we discussed the mechanisms and pathways. So there is a summary here of that um, process. So you can see that you have all sorts of microbes that are generating neurotransmitters and uh, inflammatory mediators. They are interacting with the gut and generating a number of uh, communication molecules that then will reach the brain and uh, impact behavior. So that's kind of the idea in a nutshell. So the first, the second paper, which is the first of the original research ones, was done uh, in China by uh, Professor uh, Shear's group, the, the last author there, and I collaborated with them. So they show that um, if you change the microbiome, you can change behavior. And in the companion paper that you'll see next, we show that if you change behavior, you can change the microbiome. So here, um, there are two interesting um, sets of findings. So the first one is that they have a facility in uh, Chongqing in China in which they have germ-free mice. So these mice have no bacteria, like no germs whatsoever. They're completely sterile. And it turns out that they have less depressive-like behaviors than just a standard pathogen-free mice that you have uh, kind of more benign uh, microbes, but they do have microbes. So if you look at the uh, open field uh, there, the germ-free mice have a pattern of behavior that's consistent with a, a le like lower level of depression-like behaviors. And then what's interesting is that if you get uh, do fecal transplantation, so th those mice are completely germ-free, and what people often do in that kind of study is to then introduce microbes and colonize the, the gut of the mice. So if you colonize uh, one group of mice with bacteria from depressed patients and another one with bacteria from control uh, humans, 
And then you end up with the mice receiving the bacteria from depressed. They behave in a way that's reminiscent of depression, so they have depressive-like behaviors. And um, so if you look at uh, the bacteria coming from depressed people, it's different from the bacteria coming from controls. And um, it appears that this difference is mediated by um, different types of metabolites. So it's the metabolome that appears to be involved in that process. So you have uh, two interesting findings there that one, the humans with major depression have different bacterial composition than the humans without major depression. And if you transplant that bacteria to germ-free mice that actually are kind of uh, less depressed to begin with, they become more depressed. So you can cause, can change behavior by changing the bacteria. And in this next paper here, we show that um, if you do the reverse, if you change behaviors, in other words, if you cause a depressive-like state due to chronic stress, you change the bacterial composition of the gut. And then you have uh, a loop that's mediated through the inflammasome. So we've been studying the inflammasome for many years, looking at caspase 1, which is a critical element of the NLRP3 uh, inflammasome. And then uh, we studied mice who, which had a caspase 1 knockout. So they have a decreased uh, ability to generate an inflammatory response. And at baseline, those animals are less depressed than uh, the wild type. So the levels of like, depressive-like behaviors are lower at baseline. And when they are chronically stressed, they increase a little bit, but they don't even reach the baseline of the controls. And the controls, of course, when they are chronically stressed, they develop a depressive-like behavior. So in the absence of caspase 1, the reaction to chronic stress is substantially blunted. And pharmacological or genetic inhibition of caspase 1 results in change in the microbiota. So if you look at the top graph there, you have a control group, then an, a, a group treated with an antibiotic minocycline that's actually, in addition to being an antibiotic, it's a caspase 1 inhibitor. You have the effects on the gut composition with restraint stress. And you can see that if you give minocycline and restraint, that uh, restraint effect is gone. So uh, you can block the changes in gut composition that are caused by stress if you treat the animals with minocycline. So just to be very uh, brief here, our conclusions are that germ-free mice have decreased immobility time in forest swimming relative to conventionally raised healthy control mice. The gut microbiota composition of healthy controls is different from those of people with major depression. Fecal microbiota transplantation of germ-free mice with depression microbiota derived from patients resulted in depression-like behaviors compared with colonization with healthy microbiota. Mice with depression microbiota exhibited disturbances of microbial genes and host metabolites involved in carbohydrate and amino acid metabolism indicating that depressive-like behaviors are mediated through the host metabolism. And then if you do the reverse, if you change a behavior through chronic stress, and then uh, if you look at interventions that involve genetic manipulation or pharmacological intervention, you also have changes in the, in the gut microbiota probably mediated by the inflammasome. So we propose that the, gut, uh, that the microbiota gut-brain axis, the MGB axis, is fully bidirectional, functioning in a manner through which changes in microbiota affect behavior, and changes in behavior results in change in the gut microbiota. And uh, if that's indeed true, then this axis may represent a novel therapeutic target for antidepressant treatment. So here our research program is kind of, a, we are pursuing like four lines of research, and they, are, they can be, you know, put conceptually on these, um, different components of the MGB axis. So the first goal is to elucidate the specific composition and function of micro gut microbiota after chronic stress. So we're continuing to do that. Then we're looking at the impact of caspase 1 and the NLRP3 inflammasome. And we are also looking at the impact of antidepressant treatment, which is not presented here because the work is in process. Uh, how do antidepressants change microbiota composition? Is that a, a mechanism of action, potentially? And then, additionally, we are trying to look whether a gut microbiota remodeling is a treatment for stress-induced depressive-like behaviors. 
So if you can make the animal depressed with the microbiota, could you do the opposite? Could you get an animal that... So we got an animal that was not depressed to begin with and made it depressed. So could we do the opposite? Could we get an animal that's depressed and then reduce that depression by changing the microbiota? So uh, just this morning, um, I looked at... Uh, in molecular psychiatry, you can just click on the home page and you can see the most accessed papers. So you can see that these papers, they were the most accessed a few days, a few, like, you know, maybe two weeks ago. Then they dropped. <laughs> other things came up and they, they, they dropped and other things were up and now they're back up. So, and uh, this is accessed by 100,000 people every month. So you can see that the interest is there for new ideas and new concepts that may uh, put us in different pathways than what we've been looking at. And uh, in terms of um, a conceptual framework for psychiatry, what I've been thinking a lot about is that we have the brain, and then you have defined functional changes, like the plaques and tangles of, um, of Alzheimer's disease. And, or you can have, to be discovered or to be confirmed, microstructure or functional changes. And then, regardless of which direction you're coming from, you end up with alterations in key functions of the brain, such as mood, memory, cognition, food intake, etc. So how do we approach this? And I've suggested a, a combination of vertical and horizontal integration. So in terms of um, vertical integration, you can get each disease, and could be others there, and then you go from cells to animal models to uh, first-in-human studies to clinical trials, new treatments, and eventually improved outcomes. And so that's how you go vertically. And horizontally, you would go across uh, diseases using either shared biological processes, and I've just gave you the example of uh, inflammation, microbiome, could be neuroendocrine, and there are changes in these components in different diseases, but you can you know, use them across uh, disorder processes. Or you can uh, be more technical and use technical approaches like imaging or genetics and apply them to different conditions. So that's how I think we can uh, kind of uh, tackle the challenge of psychiatric disorders. And I do believe that even though there is a lot of room for continuing to uh, gain further depth and insight into existing pathways and mechanisms, I think that in parallel we have to make a very vigorous search for novel ideas and novel concepts because there is something still missing in our understanding of those disorders. And I think we're more likely to find that if we look at new uh, sources of information. Thank you.